Он занимался применением этих методов в таких областях, как краулер поисковика Bing и управление полетом автономных беспилотных летательных аппаратов. В настоящее время Андрей занимается методами представления ситуации в обучении с подкреплениями с акцентом на робототехнические манипуляторы. Андрей представит нам лекцию на английском языке, но вы можете задавать вопросы как на английском, так и на русском, но ответы будут на английском для того, чтобы не путаться в терминологии. Андрей, здравствуйте. Слышно ли нас? Здравствуйте, Наталья, спасибо. А, да. А, у вас есть, ну, у нас в целом час тридцать на лекцию и вопросы, поэтому, может быть, лекцию там час десять, чтобы осталось время на вопросы. Понял, хорошо. Спасибо, спасибо. большое. А, здравствуйте, уважаемые слушатели. А, как Наталья только что сказала, я прочитаю лекцию на, на английском, просто чтобы вам было легче сопоставить то, о чем я буду говорить, и то, о чем э, пишут в, англоязыч в англоязычных статьях. Но на вопрос я могу ответить, в принципе, и по-русски, и по-английски. Uh, итак, поехали. Uh, so before um, talking about representation learning in RL, let's uh, establish some terminology and take a look at what representations actually are. So in general, machine learning, uh, the, the task is to find a function a mapping from some input space X to an output space Y. For example, the input space X could be uh, a space of images, and the output space could be a set of labels, such as cat or not a cat. Now, if the input space X is very complicated, as is the case, for instance, with, with images or with, uh, with um, audio waves, and then the mapping F will be very complicated as well. So how do you go about learning it? Well, let's, let's use the following trick. Let's break F down into two uh, mappings. Phi, uh, that, that is going to map from the original input space X to another space E, and P, which is going to map from the space E to the out desired out space, output space Y, so that their composition, the composition of phi and, and P, is, is F. Uh, The, the phi component uh, is going to map from input space, input space X to something whose elements, to a space whose elements are much simpler. In, in our example, uh, the space could contain uh, feature vectors that, that indicate uh, whether the uh, object in the image is, has, has ears, has whiskers, has uh, stripes, and so on. Uh, and then the mapping P will use this simplified space to make labeling decisions. The mapping phi uh, is generally going to be very complicated since its, it, since its input space is very complicated and it maps to something, uh, to something much simpler. Uh, usually it's going to be nonlinear and we're going to call it the encoder. The mapping P is going to be much simpler. We'll, we'll assume it, that it, it is linear uh, for the purpose of this talk uh, and we're going to call it the probe. Now, uh, the space E to which phi maps and from which P maps is what is known in the literature as the latent space or an embedding space or a feature space or a representation space. So the problem of representation learning is uh, amounts to learning an encoder that is going to induce a certain uh, representation space for you from which they can, you can then use to, uh, to make decisions or to, to, make, uh, um, uh, to, simplify, to simplify your classification or regression problem. Okay, so, but why learn representations? If you think about it, what we have just done is we've taken a very complicated uh, function, f, and we broke it down into another complicated function, phi, and a much simpler function, p. But in any case, we still have this complicated function, phi, uh, in the game, so what is, what, what is the benefit of, of uh, splitting f in this way? Well, there was, there was, a, there was a very uh, interesting uh, article, a position paper, uh, uh, that came out a while ago, uh, but the points that are made there still stand. It is by Joshua Bengio and his co-authors that summarizes very nicely the key reasons uh, to do representation learning for general, general machine learning. When reading this article, it's, it's, it's good to keep in mind that representation learning ultimately is automated feature engineering, something that people who have been doing ML uh, have, been, have been doing for, uh, for a very long time, 
and representation learning is just a way to uh, to to kind of automate this process. So some of the benefits of, of uh, uh, representation learning include, for instance, sample efficiency. Usually, representations uh, are learned using a separate um, optimization objective, in addition to the optimi optimization objective that you uh, that that you optimize for for the main task. And since you have two sources of training signal rather than one, uh, you can hope that the efficiency of the training of training uh, the overall function f is going to be higher. Uh, another reason to do representation learning is to transfer knowledge across tasks. A given set of features can be useful for multiple tasks at once, and as is the case especially in computer vision, you may have not you may not have enough data for any given task to learn the, the mapping f, but if you pull together the data from from uh, from several tasks, then you may uh, you may have enough to learn both an encoding an encoder and a probe for for, for each of your tasks. There's a number of other reasons. Uh, I don't want to go into them in detail because uh, they're in the article and they're generic machine learning reasons for uh, for learning representations. What this talk is going to be about is uh, uh, our RL specific reasons for, le for learning representations and RL specific ways of learning representations. Uh, a few disclaimers to begin with. First of all, uh, in this talk, when I say reinforcement learning, what I really mean is conventional reinforcement learning, imitation learning, uh, and pixel to control methods. So essentially, uh, decision making methods that involve uh, learning. Uh, this field is is extremely is extremely large, and in 50 minutes, we are only going to to essentially scratch the surface. We are not even going to mention uh, uh, all the important papers in this field. Nonetheless, the hope is that uh, this tutorial is going to be a starting point uh, for your own exploration of, uh, of, this, of this field, and I'm going to provide pointers to, uh, to a number of papers um, uh, to begin such an exploration. Here's the plan for the rest of the tutorial. First, we are going to take a look at uh, reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning, and how representation learning uh, fits, fits into the, into the uh, reinforcement learning process. Uh, then we're going to uh, take a look at the reasons that are RL-specific for learning representations. As we will see, uh, learning representations is, uh, is done using by defining a, an additional objective, in addition to the objective used by the, by the main reinforcement learning algorithm. Uh, this objective is called uh, an auxiliary task, and uh, the properties of the representations that we're going to get will depend high, strongly on the, uh, on what, which, which optimization objectives, which auxiliary tasks we choose, uh, we choose for optimization. Uh, so what we're going to take a look at is what, uh, how the properties of um, these optimiza auxiliary optimization objectives are linked to uh, the properties of the encoders that they that they induce. And then we're going to uh, take a look at some high-level takeaways uh, in case you uh, you miss uh, most of this lecture. Okay, so here is a whirlwind tour of uh, reinforcement learning. The big picture is that reinforcement learning is about an agent that interacts with an environment. It interacts with the, with the environment in, uh, in a cyclic fashion. The agent executes an action uh, uh, in the environment. The environment sends it back uh, some observations about its own state uh, and the state of the agent, uh, possibly some rewards, uh, and the, this loop is going to repeat. The, main goal of reinforcement learning is to uh, learn a recipe for agent behavior, giving an agent uh, a way to behave, uh, to choose actions, so as to maximize uh, some notion of long-term reward. Uh, mathematically, a uh, widely used model for formalizing reinforcement learning problems is called uh, POMDP, Partially Observable Markov Decision Process. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate uh, illustrate the concepts, POMDP concepts, with uh, with an example from a robotic manipulation. So a POMDP is a tuple that consists of several components. The first component is a state space, which um, uh, essentially describes all possible configurations of uh, the agent uh, and the environment, which in this case, in the case of robotic manipulation, uh, are the angles of uh, all the joints of the robotic manipulator and possibly positions of all the objects that this manipulator is, is trying to, uh, to handle. Uh, a is the action space, which describes what the, the agent can do, uh, such as all possible inputs to all the, control inputs to all the joints of, of your robot. 
uh, t is the transition function that describes what happens and with what probability if uh, an agent executes action A in state S. Uh, in much of the uh, deep RL literature, the transition function is assumed to be deterministic or near deterministic, meaning that uh, if an agent executes action A in state S, there is, a, there is only one state in which the agent can possibly, uh, one of very few states in which the agent can possibly end up. Uh, the reward function is uh, tells you what uh, reward you may get if you execute action A in state S. Uh, now, partially observable uh, Markov decision process is partially observable for a reason. The agent does not get uh, direct access to uh, to the state it is where it is where it currently is. Instead, it gets observations from uh, from the observation space. In the case of robotic manipulation, uh, the observations can be video frames or uh, readings from sensors such as four stork sensors. Uh, Z is an observation function that describes how observations are generated from the underlying states. Uh, and the final component of a, of a POMDP is, is uh, something that describes when the Markov decision process stops. Uh, there are several criteria for, uh, there are several stopping conditions for it. Uh, uh, which define different optimization criteria for POMDPs. Uh, the most popular are the finite horizon uh, criterion, which, which says that the decision process stops after L, some finite number L of steps. Um, the discovered reward uh, um, criterion that says that the, the, the process can continue forever, but the rewards um, are going to be discounted. Uh, the farther further into the future they are. And then there is the goal-directed um, uh, goal criterion that says that the process stops when, when the agent reaches a particular goal. In, uh, for most of this presentation, it doesn't matter which, which POMDP criterion, uh, stopping criterion we work with. I'm just going to assume that we're working with a discounted, uh, discounted reward criterion. Um, so uh, the semantics of, of a POMDP is that the state and action spaces can be either discrete or continuous. But in our case, we're going to assume that the time is discrete. So the agent isn't emitting actions all the time. It emits, it emits them after, uh, you know, after, after waiting for a certain interval after the previous action. Um, a uh, a POMDP in general describes a sequential process, decision-making process, where the agent you know, uh, waits for the next observation before, uh, before, executing, uh, before executing the next action. Uh, and uh, the key here is that, as already mentioned, the agent does not know which state it is in. All it gets are uh, observations from which it needs to infer a probability distribution over possible states, over its current possible states. Moreover, in RL, we also assume that the agent initially doesn't know the transition function and the reward function. So the agent doesn't know how the world works and doesn't know where in the world uh, it is in. Um, and what, what we seek to find is uh, a recipe for choosing actions for the agent. This recipe is formally known as, uh, as a policy. And uh, this policy can be made uh, on a number of types of information. Um, in particular, the agent has, all, has access to all the observations that it has received so far, uh, all the rewards that has, it has received so far. Um, but uh, as it turns out, um, to come up to, to uh, compute an optimal policy, it is enough, at least for the types of POMDP, uh, POMDPs that I have described so far, it is enough to make decisions just based on the observation history. Uh, so the solutions to uh, the POMDPs that we're going to consider in this, uh, for the purpose of this tutorial, are history dependent policies that map uh, observation histories to uh, action distributions. Now, we're going to use the term information state for uh, for uh, history of observations, because in some sense, uh, this history summarizes the, the agent's state of full state of knowledge uh, about uh, the underlying state. Uh, and uh, in the literature, you will also encounter a term a term belief state for the same uh, for the same concept. So, re reinforcement learning, you know, as uh, as is uh, any kind other kind of machine learning is about learning a function and the function that we're going to uh, try to the main function that we're going to try to learn here is uh, is a policy uh, I should also uh, mention that um, an optimal policy there is there is always at least one optimal deterministic policy for the types of POMDP that that I have just described 
However, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms um, you work with stochastic policies as well. Uh, and uh, so we're going to consider stochastic, uh, stochastic policies as valid solutions uh, in this, in this, for the purpose of this tutorial. Now, each policy uh, pi has a value function that intuitively speaking, for every possible information state gives um, an expected uh, long-term uh, return or sum of discounted rewards uh, that the agent will get if it follows policy pi from that information state. Uh, value functions are important because reinforcement learning algorithms use them to evaluate various policies and uh, to improve them. Okay, so generally a reinforcement learning algorithm in addition to producing uh, policy pi will also uh, uh, produce, produce uh, a policy, uh, a value function uh, uh, V or, uh, or a Q value function, which is, which is something that we didn't, don't need to be concerned about uh, in this talk. Uh, now, what is an optimal solution? An optimal solution is a policy that dominates in terms of expected uh, return uh, all other policies in, in all information states. And for POMDPs, such a policy is always guaranteed to exist. Now, in general, uh, POMDP is so complicated that we cannot hope to compute an optimal policy. So what we'll want to compute is uh, an approximate policy. A policy whose uh, expected return uh, from, uh, from any of the states is, is uh, not too far from the optimal expected return. So uh, this is all uh, we need to know uh, about uh, POMDPs for the, purpose, uh, for the purposes of understanding representation learning. But if you want to learn more, uh, there is an excellent book which is available for free uh, at this URL. All right, so, so what I've described so far uh, has nothing to do with, with deep reinforcement learning. Uh, POMDP is simply uh, a mathematical model, but now we're going to take a look at how deep reinforcement learning algorithms uh, solve it. So um, we're going to, since, since reinforcement learning is ultimately learning a function, uh, the, uh, the example that we saw at the beginning of, uh, of this tutorial applies here. We can, we can break, break up the, the function that reinforcement learning is trying to learn, or the functions uh, pi, v, q, and so on, into two parts, an encoder and, um, uh, and a probe. Uh, remember that the input to the function that the reinforcement learning is trying to learn is uh, an observation history, an information state. Uh, now, because, because in high dimensional observation spaces, uh, it is computationally infeasible to make decisions based on the entire history of observations so far. Typically, uh, uh, reinforcement deep RL algorithms use only the current observation or uh, several most recent observations, uh, which they put into, into a stack. Uh, a frame stack. So uh, the input to um, a function that the RL algorithm is trying to learn is, is, is a stack of observations. And the output, as I mentioned, is, is the, the policy value or, or, or value function value for, for, this, for this stack of observations. So now, how do we, how do we actually find these mappings with, with RL algorithms? Here is a general schema that pretty much all uh, RL algorithms follow. Uh, and although there are many, many detail, many differences and details uh, about RL algorithms, different RL algorithms don't really matter for the purpose of uh, for the purpose of this talk. So here is here is how RL algorithms generally work. First, they initialize a solution, uh, I, meaning they initialize uh, one or several functions that they're trying to compute, uh, and then they repeat the following process uh, many times. In each iteration, in each epoch. An RL algorithm gathers a uh, batch of experiences. Now, experiences are just trajectory segments, and on policy, um, RL algorithms gather these experiences in, in, a, in each iteration by executing the current policy in the environment uh, many times for many episodes. And off policy algorithms uh, mix experiences uh, gained by executing the current policy with some other experiences possibly from previous iterations uh, of, um, of this loop and possibly even imaginary, imaginary experiences. Um, after this batch of um, experiences is gathered, RL algorithms compute a loss of the current solution uh, at over, over, over this, this batch of experiences. Uh, 
so we pass the batch of experiences uh, or observations from, from this batch of experiences through the encoder, uh, then uh, uh, output the, then pass the res resulting representation uh, through, uh, through the RL heads, uh, and also and send, uh, send the result to, uh, to this uh, uh, optimization function, which we call RL loss, um, uh, in order to subsequently update uh, the agent with gradients of this optimization objective of this loss. What, what this loss is exactly varies from RL algorithm from one RL algorithm to another, but uh, for our purposes, it's, it's sufficient to, to keep it as abstract as just 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 some um, optimization objective. Uh, after repeating this process for many times, RL algorithms output the policy the policy pi. So in a nutshell, that's RL. Uh, again, if you want to learn more, there are many sources uh, online, which I encourage you uh, to take a look at. Uh, but what we're going to do next is take a look at how representation learning uh, fits into this uh, general RL scheme. And there are two ways to use uh, uh, representation learning together with RL. The first one is known as pre-training, where uh, we simply pre-train an encoder or take a pre-trained encoder. Uh, if you are familiar with computer vision, this is a very uh, popular approach in computer vision, where you take a pre-trained network such a, such as such as ResNet 50, uh, and use it for for the task that you want to solve by training a probe on top of it. It's, that's exactly how it works uh, in uh, in RL as well. You take an encoder, then you freeze it, meaning that you 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 refuse to to update uh, its weights during uh, during learning, and then you simply run RL. With the only difference that uh, since you have frozen the encoder, the gradients uh, of um, of the RL loss function don't affect uh, the encoder any the encoder anymore. Uh, I'm not going to say much about uh, um, uh, pre-training based representation learning for RL because uh, I mean there isn't there just isn't isn't much to say about it. It's it's really as simple uh, as as it looks um, in the slide. Uh, and there is there is a very recent example uh, of uh, of this approach uh, that that I uh, I re highly recommend uh, I, I highly recommend you to read up on. Uh, now the the second mode of uh, using representation learning with RL is more interesting. Uh, it's the so-called online representation learning, uh, and here's how it works. We start the RL process as, as we did for, for vanilla RL, we initialize the solution and start executing executing the, the learning loop. However, after we compute the RL loss, what we're going to do is we're going to compute an additional uh, auxiliary objective, so-called auxiliary task loss. And uh, when we update the, the agent with the RL loss at the same time, we're going to update the encoder of the RL agent with the loss from this from this auxiliary uh, function. Now there are uh, two points that that I would like to draw your attention to here. One, a minor technical technical point, is that uh, computing this auxiliary objective uh, generally requires some some additional processing, which is done in this additional um, uh, auxiliary head here. Uh, and the second point, which is maybe more important, is that we generally want uh, this objective to be self-supervised. Uh, we want it to be self-supervised because given how uh, data inefficient reinforcement learning generally is, we will, if, if, we, if we defined uh, the auxiliary objective to be, uh, uh, to be supervised, for instance, we, prob we, could, we could barely hope to, uh, to provide enough labeling data for, for training a good representation. Um, but other than, other than that, the reinforcement learning process works, works as it used to. We repeat this loop uh, for a number of times, and then we return, we return the policy. OK, uh, the, the seminal paper to read um, on, on this approach, on online representation learning, would, would probably be um, uh, a paper on this approach called Unreal. Uh, but there are many, many other papers that have followed since some of which we're going to look at in the next uh, in the next uh, half an hour. Uh, and uh, these other approaches have significantly improved, significantly improved on, on, uh, on Unreal. Okay, so um, 
uh, now we know what uh, representation learning is, uh, how it, and how it works with RL. So why why do it uh, specifically for RL? Well, there are several reasons, and the list that I'm going to that I'm going to uh, talk about in the next few minutes is not by by no means exhaustive, but uh, but we just don't have uh, time to delve into more reasons uh, in this in this tutorial. Uh, the, probably the reason number one is learning efficiency in single task settings. So. Deep reinforcement learning has this uh, has this nasty property that it has to work with uh, very high dimensional observation spaces, but at the same time, the training signal that you get, that you get in deep reinforcement learning is very impoverished for several reasons. First of all, you're getting banded feedback. Every time an agent executes an action in a state, it gets feedback just for that action, not for the other actions in that state. Moreover. If you are in a setting, if, if, if the rel task that you're facing uh, is, a go is goal oriented, you're only going to get reward and you haven't done any reward shaping. You're only going to get reward once you reach the goal, not at any of the steps before that. Uh, finally, uh, your actions early in a sequence of actions that you're going to take can drastically affect the outcome later on. But you're only going to find out about this many steps later. So you're also fa facing, the, facing the delayed reward problem. Now, learning an encoder, phi, uh, and freezing it before doing RL simplifies the RL problem because uh, ultimately, you don't need to learn an encoder anymore. You just need to learn a very simple uh, head probe, which is linear and, and, and much smaller than, uh, than the overall uh, uh, agent function policy. Uh, if you're doing uh, online RL, then this additional uh, optimization objective, the auxiliary optimization objective, essentially provides you an additional learning signal. So now you're not only learning using the, uh, the RL loss, you're, you're also learning using the, the auxiliary loss, uh, and uh, this generally uh, improves sample efficiency of, uh, of the RL's learning, or RL's learning process. Now, uh, the second reason, or a second cluster of reasons, is learning efficiency in multitask settings. In general, um, uh, learning a single encoder for several reinforcement learning agents, so for several tasks, um, amortizes the cost of learning. Uh, it does have issues, it can have issues of its own, such, such as that gradients from, from different reinforcement learning tasks can, uh, can conflict. Uh, but in general, uh, there, is, there is some hope that at least if you, if you do some magic on these gradients or if you, uh, or if you structure the learning process in a certain way, then uh, these tasks that you're using, uh, the, the, the uh, losses that you're using from different tasks are going to help rather than hurt train uh, the tra train, a sing train the agent fast. Uh, the third group of reasons is policy robustness. So uh, since deep neural networks are very powerful function approximators, and since the uh, training signal uh, that we have in RL is, is impoverished in a number of ways that I, that I have described, uh, these function approximators overfit easily to insignificant details of, uh, of their own problem. Uh, and um, this is especially a problem in, in, uh, um, in applied settings where you, for instance, want to train an agent in simulation uh, and apply it in, in um, uh, a physical, a real environment. Uh, but the agent overfits to some detail of the of the of the simulation and completely breaks down when you put it in the real world. Uh, now, representation learning in this case can act as a regularizer. It can, if 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 done appropriately, it can make uh, RL much more robust to uh, such overfitting. Uh, and the last reason I would like to talk about today is uh, facilitating exploration. Now, the since our real agent doesn't know where it is, uh, doesn't know how the world works, doesn't know uh, where it can get high reward initially, it needs to explore. But at the same time, it, it also it, the exploration is also very difficult for it because well, it doesn't know where it is. So if uh, the encoder helped it uh, uh, to to identify quickly which state underlying state of the world it is in, it could, could the agent could potentially find high reward states much faster than than otherwise. So. Uh, representation learning, if done right, can make uh, exploration much easier in, in RL. Okay, so um, uh, these are the general benefits that you can that we can get from uh, representation learning in RL. But the, and the question now is, so how do we actually uh, 
structure our learning process, how do we define uh, these auxiliary objectives to get some of these benefits? This is what we're going to uh, take a look at next. Um, we're going to take a look at several views as to what constitutes uh, a, good, uh, a good encoder and good representation. Uh, and there are many of these uh, points of view because, uh, well, there are many, as, as you have just seen, there are, there are many things that, um, there are many potential benefits that you can get out of representation learning, and you usually cannot get them all at once. You think carefully how to design the encoder for, for, for the aspect of reinforcement learning that you want to, uh, that you want to address. And um, we're going to start with, uh, with the uh, point of view, which I, which I call the adversarial approximation point of view on, on encoders. Uh, and to understand it, uh, I'd like to give uh, a little bit of an intuition, geometric intuition, for why an encoder is important in, uh, in, uh, in reinforcement learning. So to gain this intuition, uh, assume that the information space uh, X that, that the agent, uh, that the agent fa faces um, is finite, uh, that the representation space has some, some dimension uh, D, and that the RL heads output the value function, okay? So uh, this is the case for many reinforcement learning algorithms uh, because, as I mentioned, they, they uh, maintain uh, estimates of the value of value functions of policies that they are considering in order to decide how to improve uh, the value function in the next iteration. So, um, what is a value function? The value function in a finite uh, information, information space is uh, a vector uh, of length n uh, that gives a value for every information, information state. So if we uh, are in the representation learning setting, how do we compute uh, a value function for all, uh, for all states at the same time? Well, for, the, for all information states, we compute their representations and then we use the, the, the head uh, to map these representations to, to specific values, right? In other words, we can compute a, a value function using uh, a matrix, uh, capital Phi, whose rows are uh, representations of individual information states. Okay, so now fix an encoder, yes, which means fixing this matrix, and consider the space uh, scripted V that um, that consists uh, of the, that, it, that is spanned by um, uh, by the rows of uh, of matrix matrix phi. All right? What is the space? It is the space of all uh, value function approximations that we can represent using this encoder and any possible linear head. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this this space, which which we'll, we'll call scripted V. Subscript, subscript phi is happens to be a hyperplane because because uh, our probe um, our reinforcement learning head is linear. Now, so what? Uh, why why is this important? It is important because ultimately, the encoder phi has de has defined this hyperplane the position of this hyperplane for us. Now, how exactly this hyperplane is oriented is going to determine whether how difficult or rather how difficult it is to project the actual value functions that the real algorithm might, might encounter onto the space of, represent, of value functions that we can represent with, with this encoder. In other words, it's going to determine how big of an error we're going to incur by projecting the actual value functions we want to approximate to their best approximations. Uh, so ultimately, the encoder, the position of the hyperplane, de de defines the determines the quality of a value function approximation approximations that we're going to get. Uh, and if you want to uh, uh, read up more on this intuition, uh, here is here is a here is a recent paper that describes it very nicely. So, the single task adversarial approximation point of view on uh, on the quality of representations uh, says that it has as motivation the insight that. Uh, if you can approximate all value functions, so the value functions of all the of all the policies of uh, of your POM DP, well, then uh, the RL algorithm shouldn't shouldn't encounter any problems due to uh, due to approximation errors. Okay, so the this this viewpoint can be summarized as an encoder is is good if it minimizes the the worst possible 
approximation error that you can incur, uh, you can incur across your space of uh, value functions. All right, uh, the, the crucial insight uh, that uh, this viewpoint base is based on is that, uh, as it turns out, this, the space of all value functions of a POMDP forms a polytope in a high dimensional space. And uh, the, the space of um, value functions that can be approximated with a given encoder is, as we, as we just saw in the previous slide, a hyperplane in that space. Uh, what you see on the slide here is the size, essentially, of, of the error that you, the magnitude of the error that you incur if you try to project uh, a given value function onto this, onto this hyperplane. The value functions at the corners of this polytope, of, this, of, the, of the set of value functions of a given POMDP, are called adversarial value functions. And the idea here is that if you uh, construct auxiliary, if your if your auxiliary objective, auxiliary task, forces your your um, encoder to minimize the maximum uh, approximation error across this this entire uh, across the space of across the set of adversarial value functions, then you you are guaranteed to to minimize the the maximum error across the entire space of value functions. Okay. Um, and uh, that again um, goes along with uh, with the original motivation that that uh, good a good a good encoder should should allow you to approximate uh, any value function in in uh, um, uh, in, in the value function space of your POMDB. Now uh, there is an extension of this of this idea, an extension of this point of view that says that um, actually. The require, requiring your encoder to approximate well any value function of your POMDP is just is just too strict of a requirement. The 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 motivation for this point of view is that when an RL algorithm algorithm runs, it generates a sequence of value functions and policies, right? In every in every uh, uh, iteration, generally generates a new policy and value function, and then improves on it in the next iteration. The this, the sequence of value functions that it generates in this way is called the value improvement path. And this point of view essentially says that these are the value functions that matter. These are the value functions that you should be, your, uh, your encoder should be able to approximate, uh, approximate well. So you should be minimized, so the encoder should be minimizing uh, the linear approximation error along, for value functions along this value improvement path. Okay, now the caveat here is of course that before starting, before you start writing the RL, an RL algorithm, you don't know its value improvement path. You don't know which, which uh, value functions and policies it's going to produce. However, uh, uh, there, is, there is this work that invariably determines that if you start writing the NRL algorithm, generate a few uh, value functions and then essentially make your uh, encoder overfit to, this, to these several value functions, then this, uh, the encoder is going to perform well uh, in terms of approximating the next value functions along the value improvement path. So if you repeatedly make the encoder overfit to the to, the, to several recent uh, value functions along the value improvement path, then you can, you can uh, improve the perf learning performance uh, of uh, of this encoder. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to step away from uh, from uh, viewpoints based on this geometric intuition, because ultimately. Uh, the quality of approximation, value function approximations that your encoder provides is not all that matters for, uh, for reinforcement learning uh, and for, um, for, for speed of reinforcement learning, for stability of reinforcement learning, and so on. There are other issues uh, uh, with, with RL that we have just seen, and one of them is that uh, the reward signal in many reinforcement learning tasks is, is just too impoverished to learn from. It just, it's not surprising in a sense that RL algorithms require many samples because they are facing a very, very difficult uh, task of learning from an impoverished uh, reward signal. So uh, from according to this viewpoint, uh, a good encoder is one that gets high rewards from somewhere else. If it manages to, uh, to essentially optimize for, for some, some other uh, source of rewards and one such source of rewards are prediction tasks, all right? So, um, what are prediction tasks? Well, they really, they really could be, uh, there really could be many things in reinforcement learning. People have tried uh, predicting 
future awards based on the based on the representation of the current uh, information state predicting pixels uh, that the agents individual pixels that the agent is going to see several time steps down the line predicting representations of of states that uh, information states that the agent is going to see several time steps down the line all of these um, or many of these have been empirically shown to provide a good source of uh, uh, of, of additional rewards, uh, and uh, there are several approaches that that use uh, that use use, use similar ideas. Uh, one of which is uh, is uh, shown in the slide called uh, 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 SPR, uh, self predictive representations, which essentially tries to predict the representation of uh, of a state that the agent is going to see k steps uh, uh, into the future. Um, another point of view uh, on uh, the role of representation learning in RL is, is the robustness point of view. Uh, so, as we have seen, uh, vanilla deep reinforcement learning uh, agents tend to tend to overfit to insignificant uh, details of um, of their environment, such as individual, maybe even colors of individual pixels and in observations that we see. And according to this uh, viewpoint, a good encoder is the one. That produces representations that filter out all the all the insignificant, unimportant details, and construct features that are, in a sense, invariant to unimportant uh, changes in observations. Uh, a popular approach for uh, for um, constructing such features is uh, contrastive learning. Uh, contrastive learning based on data augmentation. Uh, the, the intuition uh, here is, is to take the actual observations that the agent is getting, then modify them in some way, in some way that, is, that should not be significant for decision making, and then make sure that the representations of these modified versions of the observations are the same or very close. Uh, this is the approach uh, used by, uh, by uh, an algorithm called curl, uh, and it's, it's it, it's good to point out that uh, this approach is actually taken uh, almost almost directly from computer vision literature. And in general, these data augmentation approaches uh, borrow heavily on, on computer vision literature. Although uh, uh, data augmentation by itself is not the only way to achieve this effect of uh, inducing uh, a representation that is insensitive to that that, that is insensitive to unimportant. Uh, uh, variations in dynamics, observations, uh, and so on. Um, the next uh, uh, point of view that I would like to examine is uh, is a multitask learning point of view. Notice that we have we are now switching from uh, optimizing representations for single task learning to optimizing representations for multitask learning. Uh, so the motivation for uh, uh, optimizing representations for multitask learning is that, uh, is, as, as in supervised learning, this can allow uh, generalizing or reusing uh, features across tasks and thereby amortizing the cost uh, of learning. So if we have several tasks, uh, multitask, uh, multitask RL approaches uh, use, the same, use one encoder to learn uh, and in multiple heads, one head per task, to learn a single multi-headed agent for uh, this set of tasks. So from this standpoint, an encoder is good if it allows doing such a thing. If, uh, it, if, if, if an encoder allows constructing a single agent, single multi-headed agent that performs as well and, and hopefully better and learns faster than agents trained for each individual task. Um, the insight here is that uh, training uh, such mul such multi-headed agent can be implemented quite easily by modifying uh, by easily by minimally modifying existing reinforcement learning algorithms. Essentially, by by training uh, this multi-headed agent on several environments simultaneously, um, uh, while 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 pretty much ignoring the the fact that the agent is also working with other environments. Uh, and it can, can also be implemented in, in uh, the training can also be implemented in other ways. Uh, so what are the auxiliary tasks here? Well, here, there is no auxiliary task that you, as the, as the designer of, of the RL agent, actually have to define. 
Here, for any given task that you're training on, the auxiliary tasks are the other tasks that the agent, this, this agent is training on. So in a sense, uh, in, in, in the simplest case, you don't actually need to do anything special uh, to, get, to get the benefit of uh, representation learning uh, in, in these multitask settings. Uh, however, the, the, the drawback of this type of multitask learning is that you need to know all the tasks that the agent uh, should be able to, to handle in advance, right? Uh, so researchers have, uh, have, have long wanted to, to extend this idea to allow an agent to learn a single policy that uh, uh, doesn't need to be retrained for a variety of tasks that you don't know a priori. So the idea here is that uh, during training, uh, you sample tasks from, from some distribution and you train on, uh, on these tasks. But, during, but you train a single encoder and you train a single head. Then at test time, the agent should be able to use this encoder and head for a new task, which is sampled from the same distribution, but possibly it is not identical to any of the tasks it has seen during training. So for, for, for doing this, uh, a good encoder is one that allows uh, a single policy to generalize across task variations, meaning that the encoder should produce features that are general enough to support this, uh, uh, this, kind, of, this kind of learning and, 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 and test time generalization. Uh, the insight uh, behind these approaches is that the big danger in this type of learning is overfitting to, to the training tasks. And uh, um, in this case, uh, it, it makes sense to define auxiliary tasks to provide some regularization during the training process uh, to, to, uh, to prevent this kind of overfit. Uh, the, the number of ways, uh, the, the types of ways in which you could do that uh, is, uh, is, is plentiful. Um, from simply using other tasks from, from the same distribution as auxiliary tasks in, in smart ways to, to introducing information bottlenecks that prevent, uh, prevent the encoder from overfitting to task details. Uh, and again, there is, again, there is a uh, host of literature, a host of papers on, on this topic, uh, which, which I highly recommend uh, reading. Now, uh, uh, the next uh, multi task uh, learning viewpoint uh, essentially says that, you know, it's, it's perhaps too, too much to hope for to train one policy that is going to just generalize to a whole bunch of tasks. Ultimately, if you want to keep your agent small, there is only so much general generalization you will be able, will be able to do. Uh, and if the tasks that you wanted to handle are too different, then they're going to interfere with each other and the agent is not going to do well on, on any of them. What this class of approaches the proposes is to train um, uh, a policy, an encoder and the head, but allow this, this pre-trained agent to adapt when it faces new problems at test time. The idea here is that we take this, this pre-trained agent and then gather a little bit of data from, from, from the te at test time from the target tasks and use this data to somehow adapt the agent. We can adapt the agent by uh, by changing its weights by doing some additional learning, and but but we don't have to. There are approaches that that don't do this and achieve the same effect in a different way. But the point is that um, uh, from the from the viewpoint of uh, meta learning, a good encoder is one that allows uh, a policy to generalize after a few after a few short adaptation, after adaptation using a small amount of data. And the insight is that we can explicitly train. The encoder, an encoder, and and the head to have this property to be easily adaptable to uh, to a set of related scenarios, to a set of similar, to a set of to a set of tasks. Uh, in this case, uh, the auxiliary tasks are uh, are tasks from from uh, from a given distribution, uh, coupled with explicit maximization of the agent's performance due after adaptation. Okay, the, the ways of doing it uh, vary and they, they tend to be kind of complicated uh, involving many details. Um, so, I suggest, uh, so I suggest you read these papers uh, to, uh, to get a better feeling for, uh, for how these methods work. Um, finally, 
there is uh, the exploration point of view. So, uh, an exploration, uh, an exploration point of view uh, address, tries to uh, address uh, this problem with RL that that uh, exploration is is just very difficult, uh, and it's difficult because the agent doesn't know which information state it is in. So here here is an example. Uh, now in this case, the, the agent is, is this cartoon character Scrat that is trying to stop stop the spaceship, and it sees uh, a number of uh, observations about its environment, a number of indicator lights in the cockpit of this of the spaceship. However, it doesn't know which of these which of these uh, uh, indicator lights uh, indicate something meaningful about the environment, and which of them are sim simply there for uh, for decoration and changing their trying to trying to change their um, their color is uh, will not will not ultimately change the underlying state of the world. So if we we manage to construct an encoder that maps information states that be behave similarly uh, to the same representation, then that would make the agent's exploration uh, problem much uh, much simpler. And there is a there is a work that uh, defines this notion of kinematic inseparability, uh, which is a formalization. Of the, of the notion of behavior similarity, uh, and uh, probably constructs a representation that that has uh, has this property. Um, so, uh, if uh, if you don't remember anymore which which viewpoints we started with, that is this is okay, uh, because in practice, uh, so there there, are, there is a number of there's a number of uh, ways to learn representations. Some of them have theoretical guarantees. Uh, some of them don't. Some just work empirically. But but in practice, it, it's it's uh, it's the, the the purely empirical methods uh, methods that that don't really give any guarantees that that tend to be the easiest to to apply, or at least they're least least restrictive into what kind of uh, reinforcement learning problems they can apply. So. Um, uh, when trying to implement an agent, I would recommend trying uh, trying those uh, methods first. Uh, now, they will still require a, a lot of hyperparameter tuning to to work successfully, uh, and they can be somewhat somewhat unpredictable. But usually, with enough hyperparameter tuning, you can get them to work fairly stably and in, in, in a predictable fashion. Uh, uh, but there is still much work. Uh, to be done to understand uh, these approaches, these purely empirical approaches, uh, and uh, to put them on, on on a firm theoretical footing. There is also a lot of work uh, to be done for the methods that provide very firm theoretical foundation, like the the concept of uh, adversarial value functions or the Homer method uh, that enables um, probably efficient exploration. There's a lot of work. In making them uh, more broadly uh, applicable, so if you're looking uh, for for research problems in this space, uh, this is this is a very very promising uh, subfield of it, where there is a lot of work to be done. Um, uh, now the takeaways. We're almost at the end of uh, of our tutorial. Uh, the takes away the, 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 the takeaways I would is something I would summarize uh, as follows. Reinforcement learning techniques currently, including imitation learning, offline RL, and so on, uh, fall short in, in many aspects. They're brittle, uh, they're not sample efficient, uh, they, their solutions don't generalize very well, and so on. Representation learning is a suite of tools for addressing these deficiencies. But in order to address a specific deficiency, you need to think carefully how to define uh, uh, your, uh, the, the corresponding auxiliary task that will drive the learning of uh, your representation. And hopefully, this tutorial has given you uh, an overview of possible ways of uh, defining auxiliary tasks uh, to, to generate your own ideas uh, in this space. Спасибо. Uh, uh, Время для вопросов. А, да, спасибо большое, Андрей. Итак, у нас, во-первых, есть вопросы из Ютуба, но давайте все-таки сначала зададим вопрос, наверное, из зала у студентов. Ребят, у кого есть вопросы? Так, ну, видимо, пока думают. Роман, сможете озвучить вопрос из Ютуба? 
Ray, uh, thank you very much for such an interesting presentation. And the first question from our stream is, uh, for example, we have an environment where we have hunter with a gun and a pack of wolves. Uh, wolves can move fast, but uh, they can only bite. And the, can the hunter moves slow, but he has a gun. For example, we have a real task uh, for a pack of wolves, not for hunter. Uh, would representation learning help us in this task? And if not, uh, could you suggest uh, the direction uh, to look at? Thank you. So I think whether re representation learning will be useful here or not depends on what kind of observations you're getting. If your observations come in the form of images, so you, you're looking at the scene through, through a camera on, on the head of the, of, the, of the hunter, for instance, then representation learning could, could definitely help. If nothing else, it will help you to reduce the dimensionality of uh, the feature space on which you're trying to make decisions and make vanilla reinforcement learning more sample efficient. However, if uh, your observations come in the form of the exact positions of the hunter, the exact positions of every wolf in the pack, uh, their velocities, and so on, then the representation learning could still help. But chances are that, that ordinary standard RL algorithms will, will do just fine. You, you probably don't need re representation learning. Okay, thank you very much. And the second question uh, is about the slide where you talked about the fact that um, you can move from uh, one V space to another along the path of improvement. And the question is, um, is uh, the space V is continuous? And uh, could, it be, could it be that some policies uh, may not be valid for evaluating the value function? So uh, let me start answering it from, from the second part of the question. Every policy has, has a value function. In the sense, the value functions are always defined with respect to a policy. So if your POMDP is well defined, so if you're using one of these, uh, say, either a dis discounted reward POMDPs or finite horizon, finite horizon POMDPs, then the value function is guaranteed to be defined for any stationary essentially for any, for any stationary policies and even many non-stationary policies. Uh, now, uh, is the space of value functions continuous? It, it, the space of value functions it generally, generally is, um, is continuous because the, we're considering stochastic policies. But uh, if your reinforcement learning algorithm say does not consider uh, stochastic policies and only works with the deterministic policies, then, then the space will not be continuous. Thank you very much. Так, ребят, есть у кого-то еще вопросы? Потому что у нас есть. Хорошо, Андрей, тогда такой вопрос. Использование вспомогательных задач для обучения представлений показало свою эффективность. А как вы думаете, можем ли мы интегрировать эти задачи в более сложный цикл обучения с подкреплением на основе модели? Да, конечно, я, к сожалению, не упомянул э, литературу по, по этой теме, но так, так и сделали. То есть, например, метод, который называется Planet э, и Dreamer, они используют э, циклы обучения, где где вспомогательные задачи интегрированы с uh, uh, model-based reinforcement learning. Спасибо. Так, ну что, а, значит, Андрей, у нас есть вопрос от профессора Владимира Ивановича Городецкого. Mm -hmm. uh, добрый день. Uh, uh, вот... Uh, Representation learning – это направление одной из э, нескольких хайпов современного, э, в современном искусственном интеллекте. Ну, не такой, конечно, хайп, как э, deep learning, но все-таки. И, э, ну, как говорит, если перефразировать русскую пословицу, которую, может, вы помните, каждому хайпу свое время, вообще-то говоря. Э, хайпу приходят и уходят, остаются только настоящие вещи. 
Uh -huh. Это как бы контекст моего вопроса, но позитивный контекст. Вот такой простой вопрос. Факторизацию матриц вы относите к representation learning или нет? Uh, да. Да, это тип, тип, тип. Да, я бы сказал, что это тип, тип representation Хорошо. learning. Хорошо. Грануляцию данных вы относите к representation learning или нет? А что вы имеете в виду под грануляцией данных? А, ну, это, это будет тема моего выступления через несколько дней. Вот понимаете, когда возникает новое направление, значит, разные направления отличаются тем, что одни вводят новый термин, другие вносят обобщение и, я бы сказал, новые методы, соответственно, и так далее, и так далее. Вот какие новые задачи появились в representation learning, которые не были раньше известны в математике или в искусственном интеллекте? Я говорю в математике, потому что, например, факторизация матриц – это чисто математическое направление, например, тензорное представление матриц, оно делается совсем не обязательно для того, чтобы выявить признаки, и оно многошаговое, может, а просто для того, чтобы, например, найти удобную экономию памяти, например, для хранения больших данных и так далее. Вот вы могли бы назвать там одну-две задачи в representation learning, которые являются новыми, вот которых не было раньше. То есть сам по себе representation learning это, мне кажется, это набор инструментов для решения существующих задач. Просто эти задачи раньше решались в, в, в контекстах, которые методы разрабатывались для контекстов, которые эти методы не работают для новых контекстов. Просто в вычислительном, в вычислительном смысле э, метод, старые, старые методы для representation learning, они не очень хорошо работают для таких сложных функций, которые представимы с помощью э, этих deep, глубоких, глубоких э, архитектур, которые используются, скажем, в Arrayle. Representation learning в, в контексте глубокого обучения, он, он конечно, mm -hmm. то есть из-за него возникают новые задачи, но это задачи больше того типа, что сам representation learning работает где-то не очень хорошо, он, например, э, дестабилизирует э, многие методы для э, representation learning, дестабилизирует э, обучение с подкреплением, и для этого требуются новые методы, чтобы опять стабилизировать э, э, reinforcement learning. Но это, мне кажется, что не, не те задачи, которые вы имели в виду. Mm -hmm. Вот, кстати, хорошо, что вы вспомнили Deep Learning. А Embedding относится к Representation Learning? Да, да, то есть Embedding и Representation, это Embedding Space и Representation Space. Но embedding — это некое промежуточное представление данных для того, чтобы потом его использовать именно как признак. То есть это некая информация в контексте. Понимаете, то есть это агрегация некая, и в этом смысле она подходит под определение того, что... Да, 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 конечно. Mm -hmm. это, это одно и то же. Mm -hmm. Ладно, спасибо. А, спасибо. У нас еще вот вопрос, Алексей. Да, здравствуйте, спасибо за вашу лекцию. У меня вопрос а, следующий. Вот, а, давайте рассмотрим задачу, когда мы а, учим представление по демонстрациям. А, вот интересен тот кейс, а, если у нас демонстрации каким-либо образом а, были а, некачественными, некорректными. Такой случай imperfect demonstration. А, есть ли какие-то алгоритмы, которые… Ну, контролирует построение вот этого представления или ну, как-то позволяет его корректировать после ну, такого обучения? Да, то есть такие методы, над, над такими методами, безусловно, работают, особенно в робототехнике, где количество данных, которые вы можете собрать, хороших данных демонстрационных для любой конкретной задачи, вы можете собрать их только ограниченное количество, но у вас могут быть данные очень худшего качества или вообще данные, собранные с другой задачи. Поэтому в робототехнике над этим работают. Ответ на ваш вопрос зависит от того, то есть насколько, насколько раз, различны задачи, с которых собраны демонстрационные данные, или насколько они по качеству уступают там, оптимальным данным, собранным с, с оптимальных стратегий. Если качество данных совсем плохое, то имеет смысл делать офлайн uh, uh, reinforcement learning. 
То есть э, не пытаться имитировать э, эти траектории, а пытаться э, выучить из них хоть что-то и разные методы в офлайн reinforcement learning выучивают из них разные вещи. Э, и потом уже на основании стратегии, которые вы выучили с помощью офлайн RL, начинать онлайн RL, если, если есть возможность э, делать онлайн RL. Uh, другой способ uh, uh, подкорректировать эти данные это делать uh, meta imitation learning. Uh, я опять же не упомянул uh, эту, эту конкретную работу, но вот uh, та же группа, которая работает над, uh, которая в общем начала uh, такие масштабные исследования в uh, meta reinforcement learning, это группа из Стэнфорда, uh, группа Челси Финн. У этой же группы есть работы по meta imitation learning, где фактически вы тренируете агента, который потом может, который, который, которого можно быстро улучшить, собрав небольшое количество хороших данных, высококачественных данных, высококачественных данных с, с вашей задачи. Спасибо за ответ. И еще небольшой вопрос, немножко, наверное, ну, сбиваясь вот с этой темы репрезентации. Как вы, ну вот, каково ваше мнение про аугментации в обучении с подкреплением? Ну вот, наверное, основная проблема в том, что довольно малый набор демонстраций из компьютер Vision применим к обучению с подкреплением. И ну вот, как вы, что вы об этом думаете? То есть в, в обучении с подкреплением в основном используется э, синтетический data augmentation. То есть вы берете э, картинки, которые, которые ваш агент получает, и что-то с ними делаете, а потом э, заставляете ваш, ваш, ваш энкодер э, в общем, э, делать так, в общем, заставляете его минимизировать э, разницу в представлениях между между настоящим, скажем, то есть настоящей картинкой, которую агент получил, и модифицированной картинкой. Поэтому то, что в, в, компьютер, в области зрения там мало, мало данных, которые позволяют делать data augmentation, это в принципе не беда. То есть это другой вопрос, что э, алгоритмы по обучению с подкреплением сейчас в основном э, тестируется на синтетических, в синтетических каких-то э, э, средах, например, там Atari или, или ProgGen, где, такая синтети, где, где такую синтетическую, э, синтетический такой data augmentation очень легко ре, реализовать. Когда эти алгоритмы начнут применяться в, в средах, где, где агент получает изображение каких-то каких каких конкретных физических сцен, ну, как, 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 э, как происходит в робототехнике. Там уже э, некоторые виды data augmentation сделать сложно, но вот, например, э, метод curl, который я упомянул, он просто берет э, 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 изображение, которое агент получает, вырезает из них кусочки, э, грубо говоря, об, обрезает рамку, и э, такой, например, такой data augmentation можно сделать даже и на, на в случае с, с картинками, с изображениями э, реальных физических сцен. Спасибо. Так, еще вопрос. А, да, добрый день. Спасибо за лекцию. А, у меня два вопроса. Первый про мультиагентный RL. А, я правильно понимаю, что в representation learning, ну, то есть обучение репрезентации, могло бы помочь как-то коммуницировать агентам, если мы говорим про групповое какое-то взаимодействие. Ну, например, я не знаю, они играют в футбол. Да. И, но вот у меня с вопрос, ну, то есть, как бы, соответственно, изуч, обучение одной репрезентации на всех могло бы им как-то коммуницировать, да, то есть мы могли построить какую-то базу вот на основе этого. Но что, если у агентов в команде разные цели? Соответственно, у них могут быть разные value функции, возможно, какие-то ну, личные, аугментированные. Э, несмотря на то, что есть какая-то одна единая базовая, ну не базовая, в смысле, единая командная цель. Вот как бы, есть какие-то здесь питфолы? Э, такое, безусловно, может быть. И, опять же, тут есть, есть, есть целый, целый пласт литературы для, для multi-agent representation learning, который я, опять же, не упомянул в, э, в 
в этой лекции. То есть такое действительно может произойти, но надо учитывать, что роль, э, роль вот энкодера — это просто вычислить э, какое-то количество фич. Для, для любого данного агента многие из этих фич могут быть, э, в общем-то, бесполезны. Но э, если этот, этот, это множество фич содержит те фичи, которые полезны для, для агента, то, в общем-то, уже, уже хорошо. Остальные фичи могут быть вычислены с помощью... Э, Uh, стратегии, то есть head, reinforcement learning head, который соответствует стратегии вот данного, данного агента. Uh, еще один подход к этой задаче, uh, возможный подход к этой задаче, взять uh, энкодер, который натренирован uh, с помощью нескольких агентов, и потом uh, в, отдельной, в отдельной фазе тренировки, в отдельной фазе обучения присоединить к нему какие-то части, которые... Uh, не обязательно сверху, а просто, просто расширить, например, сеть э, и, э, или, или добавить новые, новые, новые соединения, э, чтобы, которые агент сможет выучить уже вот в этой новой фазе обучения, в то время как остальные, остальные то есть въезд, параметры, которые были выучены изначально, они заморожены, они остаются такими, как есть, а агент просто учит э, какие-то новые параметры в дополнительной mm -hmm. фазе обучения. Да, просто у меня как раз была идея, что вот можно было бы, наверное, построить какую-то иерархию, то есть есть какой-то один базовый shared representation, mm -hmm. и у каждого есть, ну, там, не знаю, с тем же attention, какая-то подвыборка небольшая, еще с, с более сжатое подпространство какое-то для каждого свое, наверное, да? Что-то похожее тоже могло да, быть. Да, мне кажется, что это очень, очень жизнеспособная идея. Я, к сожалению, не очень много знаю вот про литературу про representation learning for multi-agent RL. Mm -hmm. Я знаю, что такая литература существует, ее много, и имеет смысл, наверное, глянуть туда. Возможно, кто-то кто уже, в общем, попытался сделать что-то подобное. Но в любом случае, мне кажется, что идея, идея очень жизнеспособна. Хорошо. Теперь это второй вопрос. Это про curriculum learning. Вот если мы пытаемся агента обучать на постепенно усложняющихся задачах и, возможно, даже постепенно усложняющихся средах, ну, наверное, представление стоит тоже как-то менять, и, возможно, даже у него будет меня... ну, стоило менять бы как бы размерность этого пространства. Вот есть какие-то… Ну, во-первых, да, во-первых, первый вопрос, как бы, стоит ли вот менять его вообще, расширять, например. И второе, есть какие-то простые способы, соответственно, ну вот переноса знаний из как бы, прежней версии более, для более простых сред и задач в более сложные. Есть что такое, какие-то такие задачи? То есть вы, вы спрашиваете про изменить ли архитектуру или изменить ли параметры? А, ну параметры кажется, что нужно менять, а вот э, архитектуру, ну не архитектуру, я имею в виду, ну да, да гиперпараметры, я, я про гиперпараметры скорее даже да, спрошу. Ну скажем так, то есть скорее всего да, скорее всего стоит. Теоретически. А так делают Но вообще? По факту, есть... это, скорее всего, настолько сложно, и оптимизация этих гиперпараметров — это настолько муторный и вычислительно в общем, требовательный процесс, что, скорее всего, результат будет лучше, если, если вы этого делать не будете, а просто будете как бы, потренировать э, параметры э, для, для каждого нового э, шага в, в вашем curriculum. И, в общем, тем ограничитесь. И еще одна вещь, которую можно сделать, это менять, то есть определить разные learning rates для, для, самого, для самого энкодера и для, для головы вашей нейронной сети, чтобы голова, скажем, менялась быстро, а энкодер менялся, менялся бы гораздо медленнее. Но вообще про curriculum learning э, что-то сказать довольно сложно, потому что нет какого-то стандартного способа э, делать curriculum learning. Mm -hmm. ну, то есть вам в голову как бы, сходу не приходят как бы, да, какие-то э, более-менее стандартные, известные решения? То есть я, я, я знаю некоторые статьи по curriculum learning, но, но там, э, там не меняют архитектуру. Э, и representation, то есть там, в принципе, не сильно акцентируется, ну, не, не сильно акцентируется внимание для, на, 
э, на представление, я понял. На обучение самого представления. То есть заранее выбирают с запасом, и как бы ну, постепенно надо обучается, да, видимо. Да, да. да. Я понял. Спасибо большое. Да, конечно. То есть, в принципе, вы понимаете, то есть, в принципе, эта проблема, эта задача, она, она, она довольно похожа на, на обычное, поведение, обычное, обычное обучение орел агента То есть, как, когда орел агент обучается, он проходит через, через какие-то стадии обучения, вот через тот же самый Value Improvement Path, где на разных этапах этого Value Improvement Path э, э, как бы разные, разные фичи имеют, имеют разное значение. И там, то есть, можно, наверное, придумать что-то что такое умное, но довольно простые методы, обычные методы э, там работают довольно, довольно хорошо, и учитывая, опять же, то, насколько, до сколько Сколько вычислений потребует там, реоптимизация гиперпараметров, если вы будете менять архитектуру, то, есть, скорее всего, эти обычные методы сработают нормально и в вашем случае. Понятно. Спасибо. Есть ли еще вопросы? Андрей, ну больше вопросов вроде бы нет. Спасибо вам большое за прекрасную лекцию. Вы можете что-то от себя добавить, если хотите, у нас еще есть время. Спасибо, да, да нет, вроде, вроде добавить нечего. Вот, единственное, что как вопросы, вопросы от зрителей отлично это проиллюстрировали. То есть то, что я, то, про что я рассказал, это как бы такой маленький кусочек representation learning. Есть, есть, есть в общем, пласт литературы про, про pre-trading, особенно в, в области вот, робототехники, есть пласт литературы про representation learning э, для э, multitask reinforcement learning. В общем, э, я, я бы советовал не, не ограничиваться, э, слушателям не ограничиваться тем, что я рассказал, и, в общем, просто э, копать, копать э, литературу в этой области и открывать для себя в общем, новые, новые ее уголки. На самом деле у меня появился один вопрос, если есть mm -hmm. время. А вот скажите, Конечно. вы в Microsoft, насколько я понимаю, работаете с объектами самой разной природы. То есть и с этими вот беспилотными аппаратами, и там с какой-то оптимизацией поисковой выдачи, по-моему. Ну то есть что-то в таком духе. А вот имеет ли смысл mm -hmm. использовать representation специфичный для предметной области? Например, там, ну, для роботов динамические системы в каком-то виде, для там, рекламы, что-то другое. Конечно. То есть, и, а в, это в смысле... применяется реально или то есть, как у вас? Безусловно. То есть в робототехнике, например, люди берут есть, натренированный, скажем, ResNet или там, натренированную другую модель, натренированную на, на изображениях реальных вещей, не каких-то там синтетических изображениях, а реальных вещей. И это, в общем, это, это хорошо работает. То есть, да. опять же, в, то, что, то, что в робототехнике этот, вот, transition function имеет определенную структуру, то есть она э, имеет осо особенности, продиктованные тем, что мы все-таки имеем, имеем дело с реальным физическим миром, э, это, это тоже используется. И, например, скорее всего, вам не, не придется учить, э, учить робота, как двигать... Э, как, двигать этот манипулятор. То есть, это, это, в принципе, вам известны все параметры э, динамики здесь, вы, вы можете просто применить методы планирования или контроля. То есть, representation learning начинается там, где, где вам неизвестна динамика, скажем, в, в, когда вы начинаете, когда робот хватает какой-то объект э, и начинает э, из, из сенсоров touch sensors, у него начинают, начинают посылать роботу информацию, вот, вот эту информацию, наверное, стоит обрабатывать с помощью каких-то э, каких там особенных э, методов э, обучения представлений, а для, опять же, для, для многих областей робототехники то есть при тренированные, при тренированные заранее э, э, представления работают отлично. Спасибо. А, так, еще вопросы есть? Появились? Нет, вопросов нет. Ну что ж, Андрей, большое вам спасибо за то, что приняли участие. Так, коллеги, у нас сейчас перерыв. 
в 12.30 у нас следующая лекция.